Oh, gee, do you know the history behind Memorial Day? Uh, I do. Well, regalus, my friend. <laughs> it was a quiz question. I see. Well, the history behind that I'm going to have to look up. Well, I thought you said you knew it. Well. <laughs> so here's what happened. World War II Day or whatever. We'll, we'll cut to the chase. No, it was actually in the years after the Civil War. According to history.com, originally known as Decoration Day, it originated after the Civil War, became an official federal holiday in 1971. Many Americans observe Memorial Day by visiting cemeteries or memorials, holding family gatherings, and participating in parades. Unofficially, it marks the beginning of the summer season, of course, and we celebrated that all last week. So on behalf of the men and women of Navy Federal Credit Union and our team here at Stacking Benjamins, a big Memorial Day shout out to our troops and also a Memorial Day moment to the men and women we've lost while they were defending this country. That's what Memorial Day is all about. If you had access to a car like this, would you take it back right away? Neither would I. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and when you focus on getting the little things right, it can often lead to big results. Just take it from today's guest, NASCAR driver Corey LaJoy. Corey is also the host of a new podcast called Stacking Pennies. Stacking Pennies? Wait, this is a joke, right? I mean, isn't that copyright infringement? Oh, man, I cannot wait for Joe to absolutely lay the lumber on this guy. Oh, speaking of lumber, how about the price inflation on lumber and some other goods? We'll tackle inflation, the fallout, and what comes next for your plans during our headline segment. Later, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to Kate, who has a question about creating a good, sustainable company culture. And now, two guys who need to protect the stacking Benjamin's name. It's Joe and O J J J J G. And I hope everyone in the United States is having a fantastic Memorial Day weekend. And for those of you around the world listening, happy Monday. Hey, it's another day on the Stacky Benjamin Show, another week. I'm Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Across the card table from me, like he is every Monday, showing up for work on a holiday, it's Mr. OG. Double time. It's, that's the only reason you show up, isn't it? Yep. yep. Mom gives us two donuts instead of one. They're pretty good donuts. The chocolate frost, it's mine, though. Just Happy saying. Monday. I don't like chocolate frosted donuts, so they're all yours. Well, that's good. That's fantastic. You know what Cheryl likes is cake donuts. Those are gross. I don't know what cake donuts are. So They're the ones that have like, uh, instead of being the poofy ones like Dunkin' Donuts, very light and fluffy, they're made of like cake material. So they're cakey. So basically she likes cupcakes? Basically she likes cupcakes. Cupcakes she, for breakfast. But I'll tell you what, if you take a cupcake and you put a hole in the middle and put frosting on it, it's gross. But if you make it where it's like a cupcake with frosting across it, no hole, fantastic. The hole makes all the difference. No holes in this show, OG, huh? Huh? Never are. We got uh, NASCAR driver Corey LaJoy coming down to the basement. Might to give him a piece of our mind, fringing on our territory with his new podcast called Stacking Pennies. I heard this and thought, what the heck is this about? And actually, what I love, and when we've talked about racing, or sports in the past, while you may not be on board initially with sports analogies, I think there are a t- there's so many teamwork things happening. There's so many people racing for the same dollar. There's so many analogies. And with a guy like Corey LaJoy, I think you're also going to have a lot of fun on a holiday talking to him. Of course, lots of races over this holiday weekend. Lots of uh, from... I've the- been to the Indy 500. Indy 500. It's pretty awesome. Coca-Cola 600 that Corey LaJoy was in yesterday. 
So lots of good stuff. But first, we've got a couple of big headlines today. But even before that. This episode is brought to you by Simply by Frito-Lay. You have enough on your plate, but now there's one less thing to overthink with Simply by Frito-Lay. It's your favorite Frito-Lay snacks with ingredients to feel good about, like Simply Blue Corn Tostitos, Sea Salted Ruffles, and White Cheddar Cheetos Puffs all made with no artificial flavors or colors. So enjoy what you love and look for Simply Brand Snacks online or at a store near you. When you're something amazing, Discover matches all the cash back you earn on your credit card at the end of your first year automatically with no limit on how much you can earn. How amazing is that? In fact, it's even more amazing because of all the places where Discover is accepted. 99% of places in the U.S. that take credit cards. So when it comes to Discover, get used to hearing yes more often. Learn more at discover.com slash yes. 2021 Nielsen Report. Limitations apply. We've got Corey LaJoy, NASCAR driver. Corey LaJoy waiting in the wings to talk about teamwork, precision, synergy among teams, sponsorships trying to earn more money. So let's get this Memorial Day episode started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from CNN.com. This is something disturbing. I'm, I'm so happy I started my home remodel when I did because our main room, like a Bavarian lodge, has these beams running across the living room. And if you've been anywhere near a lumber yard lately, you know, oh, gee, that uh, there's some there's some issues with prices right now. Jordan Valinsky writes this for CNN Business. Used cars, homes, lumber, gas and chicken. What are they all have in common? They're all getting more expensive. The stimulus fueled economy is rebounding. Americans are again spending on shopping, travel and eating out. But the pandemic's far from over. And supply chain woes mean supply isn't meeting demand, setting prices even higher. U.S. consumer prices in April increased 4.2% from a year earlier, more than the 3.6% economists have predicted. It was the biggest 12-month increase since September 2008, the height of the financial crisis. Price of chicken, number one going up. Chickens are in short supply, sparking an increase in prices. Oh shucks, I have to eat more steak? <laughs> Oh, Dang bummer. It. Or just go vegan. Just become a vegan. I said I can eat more steak. Or you could become a vegan. Part of the blame, it says, goes to Tyson's Roosters. The meat processor, which sells poultry along with beef and pork, said that its chicken volumes have been low in part because the roosters it uses for breeding are not meeting expectations. <laughs> I, That's I, funny. I wish, I wish I was making that up. Oh, do I got... Do I get some Barry White music out here? <laughs> I want to know who's in charge of the motivation for the roosters. They have to set the stage for the roosters. You know, it's like nice lighting, maybe a cocktail, some appetizers, a little glass of wine. Is there a rooster version of the little blue pill? We're changing out a male that, quite frankly, we made a bad decision on, says Donny King. Tyson's We're chief changing one out, like tapping him out, like, dude, no, chief no you're out, you're done. Officer and group president of poultry during an analyst call this week. Uh, they're switching back to the male breeding chickens they previously used. Dude's got fired, and the second the second they got let go, they're like, "Told you it wasn't going to work." <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're gonna. It sounds like he's like a uh, GM for a major league baseball team. Yeah, we're uh, we made a play here for the left-hander, but uh, but we got to go back to what works, and we're bringing in the closer. Gasoline prices also up, of course, a growing number of gas stations along the East Coast were without fuel as nervous drivers aggressively filled up their tanks following a ransomware attack. That's a whole different headline, by the way. The number of ransomware attacks there have been lately, OG, that's pretty troubling. Quite a number. Home prices, we reported on that last week. Lumber. Shortages delaying construction of badly needed new homes, complicating renovations of existing ones, causing sticker shock for buyers and what was already a scorching market. That's the one that's crazy. It is. It is crazy. Ooh. My The cost of my living room remodel would have been a ton more had we not gotten on it right away. So brilliant move spending all that money early on my good, part. Good job. <laughs> Strategery. 
uh, used cars and trucks. This one, did you know about this one? I do know about it. We have a very, I've got an interesting question for the audience. Maybe I'll ask in a little bit, but uh, yes, it's, it's crazy. The biggest driver of all of April's inflation jump, a steep 10% increase in used cars and truck prices. That spike accounted for more than a third of the overall inflation increase and was the biggest price rise since the government started tracking car data in 1953. Over one year, used car prices rose 21%. Making matters worse is that car dealer lots have only gotten a fraction of the vehicles that typically they have of both new and used vehicles. And that partly, OG, is because of the chip shortage that's going on on a drive from texas to michigan recently i passed on i-71 the kentucky speedway it was two o'clock in the afternoon on a random thursday and the lot was completely full and i thought what the hell's going on and then i looked again og and they were all ford trucks i saw that picture on the interwebs entire lot full of ford trucks and at the time i thought boy nobody's buying new cars and then I found out these cars are done, except for the chips. They got to get the, got to get the chip in them. So the the first level discussion here is that we have a problem, but I think there's a deeper, two deeper discussions. And let's start off with the most basic one. If I need a used car right now, or I need a car right now, OG, or I'm thinking about a remodel of my house, or I want to move, any of these areas that's really being hit with hyperinflation right now, do I wait? Do I pull the trigger because time is money? What, what do you think we do? Price is coming down anytime soon? Oh, gosh. I wish I knew. Where's Len's crystal ball? I wonder if prices don't come down if they stabilize, if we don't see a continued increase, but maybe the the flat line is kind of the new normal. I don't know. That's such a stupid thing to say, new normal. But um yeah, we've got a remodel for a rental property that we own, and the property manager keeps on trying to tell us like to drag our feet. He's like, you don't want to do it right now. A, there's no material. B, the material that there is costs three times as much. It's hard to find work, you know, because everybody's booked, because everybody's got extra money. So all these projects have been piled up. The guy finishing our remodel says he's booked up for the next three months. Yeah, great, right? I mean, that's awesome. Oh, no, he thinks... He thinks it's great, but it's also frustrating for him because he knows that in other times he's been around the block, not his first home remodel. And he knows other times when he's practically starving for work. And now he's got so much of it that he wishes it was, we talked about this yesterday, that was a little more parceled out, you know, because you don't want to turn down stuff when you're self-employed. You don't want to turn down anything. Right. So I'm struggling with that from a owner standpoint going, Hey, I've got these units that are empty that could be generating money if they were done, but it's going to cost me twice as much to get them done. If I, if I would have put a, pulled a Sol C high and got off my keister a year ago, this thing would have been, would have been good. But, um, that's the first time anybody accused me of being quick about anything, spending money intelligently, <laughs> very like, quickly, but it's a good thing we did this. Yeah. Talk about, talk about anchoring. Right. But here's a question. So talking about the used car market, we have a minivan. We have the the grocery getter, the family Toyota, and it's got 60,000 miles on it. We own it outright. We've had it for three years. We drive the heck out of it. And uh, just got a flyer in the mail from the dealership that says, if you bring it in, we'll give you 30 grand. I bought it for 39 three years ago. Now, obviously, I have to get a new one, right? So the new ones are 50, let's say. So I get 30, it get cost me 50, but if I get the hybrid version, I get a little tax credit, about 7500 bucks. So, do I do the dosi do, you know, like plus bring 13 grand cash all net in net out and I got a brandy new one. Or do I just say $13,000 is, you know, and these are one of, of those times, too, that with the used car market being through the roof, it doesn't make it the layup that often a used car is, right? There are some times when buying a new car makes far more sense than buying a used car. Oh, yeah. You're saying buy a used car instead of a new one, but I just don't think the inventory is there. There's hardly any inventory on the on the new side. Yeah. Yeah. So get a new one for 13 grand. I start over, you know, it's paid for in cash and I've got a you know, the warranty and the maintenance plan and all the bells and whistles and yada, yada, yada. Or you don't need it. So why blow the 13 grand? OG at com. Just kind of curious. About your take. 
I think I take all of these issues and I always think that when I struggle with these situations, I should go back to the basics. And I think the basic here is this is the reason why you keep a good emergency fund so that you have the ability to do what you want to do if you really want to do it. Because, oh, gee, you know, when you talk about hitting the pause button on these rental properties, you don't know how long this is going to go. So if you want to go ahead and do the work right now, full well knowing it's going to cost more with a bigger emergency fund, you can go ahead and get the work done versus betting that even though I'm losing money every month, my crossover point will be quicker. Not being in a place where we don't have to play those mind games, I think is probably better. Yeah. If you have the stability and the access to, to make the choice. Yeah. And that's where the rubber meets the road is it's not, do I do this or not do it? Because I don't have the money to do both. It's that I do have the money to do whatever I want. How important is it to me to do it now? Is it important enough that I'm willing to pay three X for my lumber cost? And if it is, and I can do it because I got the emergency fund, well, fine. But if I don't, not, not fine. Third level on this thing though, OG, I think is this idea of inflation is something that people don't think about when they think about their retirement nest egg, their money. Like people think of safety as putting money in a savings account. Putting money in a savings account right now isn't safe at all. If interest, if interest on your savings account is half a percent and inflation over the last year has been four point what? You have ver- you very safely lost your ass. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you turn around and say, well, I've got to take my emergency fund and it has to be in stocks or something like that. No, I'm not talking about your emergency fund. I'm talking about people with their long-term savings sitting on all this cash because they don't know what to do right now because the market's high. Waiting for I'm, the market to and recover. And I'm worried. Yeah. And someday I'm going to go ahead and invest it. It's, it's, you, you can't play. Those are the games you can't afford to play because of inflation. Yep. There is no better place for inflation protection than, uh, than the stock market. So chop, chop, everybody. Get, get in. I think when it comes to the long term, knowing that whether the stock market goes up or down here over the short term, it's so important to have that confidence, OG, that you know that, uh, you know, if our economy is going to continue, it's all based on stocks. It's not voodoo. Hey, time for our TikTok minute every Monday here on the show. And even though it's a holiday, it's no exception, peeps. We play a TikTok uh, creator video, somebody giving great tongue firmly in cheek most of the time, great financial advice on the internet. And this is a a gentleman, believe it or not, OG, talking about uh, crypto. And well, let's, let's give it a listen. This is me sitting in my buddy's Lambo. And you know how he bought it? And a house cash with XRP. And he swears to me, XRP is going to a thousand. Now, I wouldn't normally listen to somebody, but this is a buddy and that is a Lambo. You can't fight with it. I, Logic I is just, sound. I don't listen to any random person, but... This guy's my buddy and it's a Lambo, which is why I made a TikTok video about it so that I could tell people who aren't my buddy and don't own Lambos. Oh, so wait, hold on. So we're listening to the guy who's got a friend who also, who said it. Well, okay. I got it. Okay. Yes. My friend's friend said it's going to be amazing. <laughs> XRP, you got to get in it. We talk about getting data. This is the scariest thing. No matter what run up there's ever been. It's accompanied OG by my buddy says, or the person in the next cubicle is, in fact, it hits close to home when GME went through the roof. Still And is. I told the story though about my family member when it hit the, rang the bell, Cheryl came to me and said, why the hell didn't we do that? Yeah. I asked the same question. Because the, fo- the FOMO, the FOMO is strong. Yep. But if it's not part of your plan, man, it's fun to have fun. You know, I've got a buddy of mine who is 100% a casino addict, right? I mean, he, he, uh, maybe not addict, but that's what he does for fun. He texts me a picture of of him in Vegas and making some serious cash. 
you know, but that's, he's gambling. He knows that he's going to come home with something or nothing, you know, like so there's no middle ground. That's kind of his thing. And so if you want to gamble and have some fun, then gamble and have some fun, but don't psych, don't, don't psychologically call that your investment account or something like that. You know what I mean? And don't gamble. Just like they say, don't gamble more than you can lose. Don't put your cash reserve in Ethereum, you know, because this is all the same symptom of the same problem, which is I feel like I'm behind. I need to do something extraordinary to catch up. And the only thing I can think of is to buy massive call options on GME. And it's like, no, you have time. You have to build this the right way. You have to have a cash reserve. You have to pay off your debt. You have to do it the logical way so that you get the ability to have fun money with crypto and Bitcoin and, and you know, whatever else. And you want to do call options on GME. Like, that's awesome. It's fun to do. But you can't do that. You haven't earned the responsibility yet. You haven't earned the right to be able to do that yet. If you're still up to your eyeballs in credit card debt, you got to tackle that stuff first. This is the time I like thinking of myself as a company CFO. You know, imagine that you're doing your shareholder call. You know, it's like, where is the Tyson guy telling people that your roosters are underperforming? <laughs> but imagine you on the call with your My investors. My rooster always underperforms. <laughs> imagine. On the, it's a whole different show, man. Imagine that uh, you're standing in front of your board of directors and you go, yeah, hey, uh, uh, we had a little hit here. We took everything and we uh, FOMO'd into Dogecoin. And uh, so basically you're Elon Musk. Didn't quite work out the way I thought that it would. So you're pretending to be Elon Musk. No well, a conversation. Isn't that what he did? He went, hey, we're going to take a billion dollars and put it in Bitcoin. Oh, my God. We made more money this quarter in Bitcoin than we've ever made doing anything else as a company. But I think that let's take a look at what you just said, though. You've got Elon Musk who can afford to do that because he's got these companies out here doing, making profits, making money, eh. taking stuff into space, digging holes under Vegas, putting out uh, electric cars. I think the conspiracy theory people say that the only reason he did it was to make enough money so that he could keep doing those things because he hasn't made any money doing those other things. But it's still brilliant, still fun. But he's got to, he's, he's still diversified. He still has all these other assets in other places. But if I'm a company CFO and I say, hey, our research and development department, I really like crypto, right? How much money is a company going to put into R&D? You're going to put a percentage, but you're not going to put it all there. Right. So I don't know. I like that analogy. Take care of yourself. So a uh, great TikTok minute there. Buddy with the Lambo says it's going to the moon. So we should believe that. And inflation prices. What's our biggest takeaway, OG? I don't know. I, I just keep coming back to the sensation of being behind and needing to catch up. And whether that is in the sense of like, but I'm already 25. I need to buy a house. All my friends are. And I don't care what price it is. I got to get one. That sort of scenario, which is happening in the housing market to some degree. If it's the, I really want to build a deck and I absolutely positively have to do it now type of thing. Like I feel like I have to catch up. And so I don't care what price I'm going to pay or all the cars are gone. So I got to buy a new one. Yeah. <laughs> or it's everybody else is getting rich on Bitcoin and I'm not it feels like you're behind. And so the reason that you're doing those things is because you feel like it's the only way to catch up or keep pace. And the reality is, is that that's not the case. You just follow the plan. Yeah. I think the only reason you feel behind is because you don't have a solid plan of your own, right? Yep. Cause I think even if you were behind on your own plan and it was solidified and we knew that you were behind by X amount of dollars or X amount per month that you need to save, Instead of YOLOing into Bitcoin or Dogecoin or whatever the latest thing is into GME, you're going to start a side business, right? start another stream of income, find reliable ways to make that money instead of crossing your fingers. That wasn't mine, actually. My takeaway was uh, don't be a rooster that doesn't perform at Tyson. They will get you. They, they, they'll figure it out, man. Let's you and I refill our coffee cups, OG, for the second half of the show. Doug is here with trivia. Everybody put on your trivia thinking cap. Doug? 
trivia fans. I'm your pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And, you know, Joe's mom just popped some popcorn, and we're all waiting for Joe to just give it to NASCAR driver Corey LaJoy. Stacking pennies? Seriously? This is going to be worse than that epic Monopoly game back in 13. You know, some entertainment will be fun to wrap up a long holiday weekend because, I mean, I am exhausted. We just wrapped up the World Texarkana Fair, a.k.a. WTF, and it was a hit! By far, the best carnival yet. I'll tell you more about that after I deliver today's trivia question. On this date in 1884, John Harvey Kellogg patented cornflakes. So the question is, what is the top-selling cereal today in the United States? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can go pour yourself a bowl of the best cereal. Lucky Charms, of course. No, no, it is not Grape Nuts. How old are you, OG? Like 107? Chewing on rocks. If you're somebody with student loans, you want to make sure you have a plan with your student loans, because that world OG has changed so much in the last year and a great place to start your search is at studentloanhero.com. When you head to student loan hero, you will find not only debt repayment strategies and the latest news about what's going on with student loans. But if you're somebody who is wondering how you're going to finance your education, they have great breakdowns on exactly what loans are worth taking and which ones aren't and other ways, hopefully, to pay for college. So everything from prepayment calculators to refinancing calculators, there's actually 20 calculators in all, a uh, list of forgiveness programs and options, the best banks to consolidate with, why you might not want to consolidate, uh, 10 essential things to ask before refinancing it's all at studentloanhero.com. Head to Student Loan Hero and get a great plan together to finance your education dreams. Well, did you know with the More Rewards credit card from Navy Federal Credit Union, you can earn three times the points at supermarkets, food delivering, gas, plus one point on everything else. Now, don't play this game if you don't pay off your credit cards in full, but if you do stackers, you're going to love the fact that your rewards won't expire while your account's open and you can redeem them for cash, for travel, for gift cards, and more. Plus, the More Rewards card is contactless. So you can make payments quickly and securely with just a tap of your card. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself with a new car. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app, online, or by phone, and it's so fast, you can get a decision in seconds. Right now, rates are as low as 1.79% APR, Plus, with Navy Federal's car buying service powered by True Car, you can shop, compare, and save on your next new or used car. I've used True Car through Navy Federal OG. Powerful, powerful tool. If you're going to go the new car route, and we talked about in our headlines that this may be a time to do that, don't just walk into a dealership, pit dealers against each other. And I'll tell you a mistake I made at the end. I had a dealer in Dallas, two and a half hours away, actually McKinney. So how far away is that? It's closer than Dallas, actually. Two hours and 10 minutes away. <laughs> that was that, that when we decided to buy a new car was driving the price down to the point that a dealer in Shreveport, 90 minutes south of me and in Texarkana were bidding with this person in McKinney who was just driving the price down to the point that the other dealers wanted to see it in writing. And all I wrote was, hey, these other dealers don't believe you. Can you put that in writing? And he's like, yep, here it is. I should have gone with that person, by the way. And the reason is, is that I found out later that my local dealer, because they would match that deal, took the deal, horrible service department, rotten customer service. And the McKinney guy was just laying it all out. Was just, I don't know. I still made mistakes, even though I saved a bunch of money using the true car service. So whether it's your first car or your dream car, Navy Federal can help you cruise into a car and a payment that you can afford it. Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Insured by NCUA, open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. American Express is a registered service mark of American Express used by Navy Federal under license. Credit and collateral subject to approval, rates subject to change, and are based on creditworthiness, rate available for new vehicles. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more 
information and to apply. Life is full of things to manage. Your work, your family, your plans, and your treatment. Consider Kesimpta, Ofatumumab 20 milligram injection. You can take it yourself from the comfort of home. If you're ready for something different, ask your healthcare provider about Kesimpta and check out the details at kesimpta.com. Brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. Hey, stackers, it's me, neighbor Doug. And like I was telling you, our Memorial Day Carnival, the WTF, was an absolute hit over the Memorial Day weekend. I mean, it wasn't great in terms of attendance. And it could have been better if it didn't rain. But here's the upside. I mean, it's a big upside. We'll go down as the first carnival ever to accept payment in a cryptocurrency. Doug Coin, of course. I mean, no one actually paid in Doug Coin, but we were accepting it. It, it, it could have, it was a possibility. We would have done it. And we're celebrating because little Timmy didn't lose his retainer in the bobbing for apples bucket. And this was the first time in three years no one called the Texarkana Police Department. Huge win. Let's get Corey LaJoy here to talk about stacking pennies. But before we do, how about a trivia answer? The question is, what is the top selling cereal in the United States? Well, coming in at third with $400 million in sales, it's Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Isn't that the one that has shrimp tails in it, allegedly? Look that up. Look up that story, research guy. That's going to be epic. Okay, at number two, with $425 million in sales, it's Frosted Flakes. And the big number one, with $481 million in sales, is... Really? Okay, it's Honey Nut Cheerios. Okay, here comes NASCAR driver Corey LaJoy. See ya! Honey Nut Cheerios. Right, OG, time for the throwdown. NASCAR driver Corey LaJoy stepping on our territory. New podcast, Stacking Pennies. Got to find out what that's all about. Maybe you can go ahead and stack pennies. We'll stack $100 bills. Actually, what is that all about? What does it mean? And what can his career help us all with when it comes to doing better work, focusing on the right things in our career, and earning more money? For those of you that don't know Corey LaJoy, he's a third generation race car driver. His dad, Randy LaJoy, is a guy I followed all the way through his career. And Corey, I've enjoyed watching ever since he was in the ARCA series, which for the people that don't know, NASCAR is a minor league series, but he's worked his way up from NASCAR k and Pro Series East, ARCA Menard Series, spend a little time in the NASCAR Xfinity series and the, in the NASCAR camping world truck series before he moved on to being in the NASCAR cup series full time. Now he drives for an up and coming company called Spire Motorsports. They have an interesting history and he also made a switch recently OG from a team that was really floundering to a team that is up and coming and, and in our show guide, which you can get a guide to every show at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. You'll read a great opinion piece about how Corey LaJoy bet on himself. And I'm going to ask him about that too. There are times in your career when you need to bet on yourself. So let's say hi to a guy who not only has two generations of his family, his dad and his grandfather, who are in the New England Auto Racing Hall of Fame, but a guy who's a heck of a NASCAR driver himself. Let's say hi to Corey LaJoy. And coming down the stairs to mom's basement, it's our new friend, Corey LaJoy. How are you, man? I'm good, Joe. Thank you for having me on. Let's start off, dude, with the elephant in the room. When I read about the podcast, I heard the podcast was called Stacking Pennies. I immediately thought, you know what? This is a way for Corey LaJoy to get a little piece of our action. I was fairly certain that you're just trying to be a part of the cool kids here in Money Nerdville. Is that, is that what's going on? It wasn't. Now, your podcast is labeled Stacking Benjamins, a little bit different for the reasons why mine's called Stacking Pennies. So my Stacking Pennies has kind of been my motto, if you will, for the last couple of years, because I've driven for some 
you know, lower ended and low budgeted race teams. So you had to figure out where the wins were quote unquote wins, because you're not, you don't have a chance to win the trophy, but you have to figure out what makes you motivated, you know, throughout the course of the day and figure out achievable goals. That way you can say you check something off to, to just stay in it and stay engaged and stay motivated. So uh, after talking to a couple of sports psychologists to try to just figure out what it is that, you know, can keep you motivated when you don't get any of that merit or that accolades on the back end, we started just calling them pennies. So you don't have, uh, you know, whether it's pit road rolling speed, whether it's just passing a couple cars that are just, I guess, execute and not making any mistakes. That was that was a penny. And you keep adding a penny to the stack and eventually you have a decent amount of money. Uh, so that was just a way for me to stay engaged and 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 really start. I guess looking internally instead of making excuses about what I don't have, figure out what I do have and make the most of it. But that's a great lesson for our listeners because money nerds, Corey, always want to start off with the fun, sexy stuff, right? I mean, I I know that you guys have had some sponsorships with uh, Arc.io, who does a lot of work with blockchain. So uh, uh, people want to get started with Bitcoin. They want to start with a sexy okay. stock portfolio. But it really is about paying off the credit cards, which is pretty damn boring, and getting out of debt and getting yeah. getting your house in order. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about with your team, doing the little things. Yeah, because you can you can lose sight of the small things, the small details that that matter in the end, because you're trying to do the sexy things. You're trying to hit the you're trying to hit the home run when you need to be trying to hit singles. And with our team here at Spire Motorsports, we're essentially a brand new team where we're trying to make sure that we do the little things and get the processes right. That way, once we get the speed in our cars and we start competing against teams that spend double, triple the amount of money we spend, we have the foundation built on really how to execute. And it really just starts by figuring out what those details are that we do have control of and then execute those each and every week. Sometimes we don't. It's easier, easier said than done. But uh, if you keep stacking pennies every week, eventually you get to the point where you have a dollar. Yes. And then a Benjamin and then we're rolling. Our average listener has no idea what goes into a team. In fact, before a couple of years ago, when I got invited to a NASCAR pit, I had no idea, Corey, what goes into a team. So for you to get out there on the weekend and to compete, can you talk about all the different roles that are on the team? How many different people are on your team at Spire Motorsports and what are some of those people and what do they do? Well, I think it's, it's split up about half and half. So some guys stay at the shop, and that's obviously the shop crew. And we have a road crew that goes with limited practice with COVID regulations and protocols. I think we're only bringing probably six or seven guys on the road. So Ryan Sparks is, is kind of the crew chief, which he's kind of like the head coach. Um, we have our car chief, who's kind of like the offensive coordinator, front end mechanic, underneath mechanic, and interior guy. And that's really about it. Uh, by the time the car gets to the track, it's pretty well set up for the race, ready to go. So they roll it through technical inspection and uh, and they just put it up on the up on the grid and, and we usually rock and roll with no practice. Now when we do go to some places where NASCAR allows us to practice, we'll bring a couple extra guys. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a pretty bare bone skeleton crew that's out there slinging springs every week. How much as a driver do you pay attention to and getting in there underneath the car, working on the car yourself, or are you just the guy that grabs the wheel and goes? No, I've never been like that. Cause my dad always taught me to, to have to get in there and get dirty on it and know what I'm driving. So I had a necessity I had to, uh, but lately, you know, when you get to driving for these cup guys, they got obviously really high caliber mechanics working on it and they don't want the driver in there messing anything up. So, uh, I, I'm probably doing less physical work on the car, but I'm still involved with setup and, and what we're going to do to try to make our, our Camaro fast every week through just conversations and looking back at previous notes from different tracks and, uh, you know, I think I'm probably more a little, te- little more technical than, than a lot of the guys because that's kind of what's gotten me to this point. But when you got some professionals, you know, they, I'm a, I guess I'm a professional driver, but there are professional mechanics particularly good at their job as well. So they won't let me, they won't let me take a wrench out of their hand to uh, to put some on the car for sure. Listening to the radio though, between you and your spotter, and between you and the crew chief. There's a lot of communication in driving a team going as fast as you're going. It seems to me that knowing a little bit about what's going on underneath can really help the team immensely. For sure. I feel like I've always had a good feel for, you know, I can feel every individual tire, every individual corner of the car. So I can, I feel like I've been fairly good at pinpointing what area of the car we need to work on versus just saying the car's loose or tight. You can narrow down on, okay, we need to work on the left front area. We need to work on the right rear area. 
so we can get from out of the ballpark to kind of where we need to be a little bit quicker, just from that experience I've had throughout the course of my, my life, you know, at the end of the day, simulation is pretty prevalent in our sport with, you know, they can put in the map of a car on the simulation model and literally run it on the racetrack and it spits out uh, what the car is going to do on this old squiggly line graph thing. So it's crazy how the sport's progressed. It's way over my head at this juncture, but uh, I'm certainly lucky to be able to, to do what I love each and every week with, with people I enjoy doing it with. I want to ask you about physical fitness because I didn't realize, you know, everybody that's listening to the show, if they're over 16, they probably driven a car, but they don't drive a car like you do. How much time do you have to spend on physical fitness to be in the seat for as long as your races go? You know, some guys do a little more than others, but I feel like that's pretty high on my, my priority list with spending time trying to make myself as good as shape as possible. And, and you know, the cockpit temperatures get upwards 130, 140 degrees and the wheels are hard to turn and there's a lot of G-force on your body and on your neck. It is not easy. It's pretty physically taxing. So there's certain, you know, are you catching a ball or throwing a ball or go- swinging a golf club? No, but uh, there's a lot of physical toll. that's certainly different than anything else that you'd be uh, accustomed to. So I just think, you know. I just think Corey, not to cut you off, but to be able to make decisions at 180 miles an hour after 90 minutes at 120 degrees. And obviously emotions might be running high. The car might not be working the way you want to physical fitness for me, I think would be huge at that point. Absolutely. But the physical side, you, know, you work your, your physical body that way, to your point, when you need to make a split second reaction mentally uh, later in the race, when you've burnt 3000 calories, when you're dehydrated, when you're over, uh, you know, you're, you're so hot. Uh, that's where mental toughness comes in as well. There's a whole other mental side of the, the coin to stay engaged and, and to stay sharp because if your nutrition's not there, if your physical fitness level is low, you're not going to be able to, to, to make those split section decisions. Maybe not, you might be able to make them, but they might not be the right one all the yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you spend time in simulators at all? Do, do you find yourself on the Xbox playing NASCAR heat on the weekend? No, not necessarily Xboxes, but there's a pretty good software called iRacing. They have pretty accurate track scans. Anybody can hop on uh, their computer and, and download iRacing. And you can even jump on there one night and see Dale Jr. or myself or a lot of guys jumping on having some, some fun. So anybody, even you can jump on one night and see some professional guys racing. You can jump in a race with them. So it's a pretty unique platform. I don't spend much time on it because I've got a a one-year-old and a wife at the house that <laughs> whenever I am home, I try to spend as much time with them as possible. So I don't get to go down there and play video games as probably often as I'd like. Most of us in our working career have two bosses. We have customers that we're working with, and we also have a boss who leads the, you know, the charge at my organization at Spire Motorsports. You've got the people that own the company that you work for. You've got fans like me, Corey, that want to see you do well. But you've got this third thing going on, which is sponsors. And I know last year you made a big, big switch. And I read a Forbes article talking about how you took a big bet on yourself and that really sponsors kind of also helped you through that. Walk me through the sponsorship game that comes with driving, because that seems to be something that even if you're a great driver, if you don't have sponsorship help, it might not be enough. Yeah, the cost to compete has risen exponentially. So, um, you know, back in the early 90s, because my dad raced and had a pretty successful career, the teams would go out and sell a sponsor. Then they would go hire the best available driver. Being that the cost to compete is exponential, the sponsorship model kind of shifted to where sponsors such as Schluter Systems, who's been a, a great supporter of mine, they see more value in investing in the driver's brand where I can go to their tile shows or I can go to shows and do social media content. And they continue to stick with me as I go from different teams. It also gives me more leverage in those conversations, talking to different teams if you have more sponsorship than the next guy. So as much as I work to try to hone my craft on the racetrack, I'm also working to find new partners that are a natural fit. You know, another one is Built Bar. It's a protein bar company. So I try to stay in good shape and they have a great product. So that works well. And the social media stuff that we shoot for those guys is is organic and, and authentic to me because I support the product. So it's uh, having loyal partners has certainly helped me get to where I'm at today. But how do you divide that time between your current sponsors, finding new sponsors and just time in the seat being a better driver? 
Yeah, I mean, there's always only so many avenues that you can do to try to be a better driver, right? You, you have a little bit of simulation time with the OEMs man, the, with their own simulator. So, you know, we don't get to spend a whole lot of time on there. Uh, you know, I can, I've got a go-kart, I zip around and just try to stay sharp in that regard. But other than that, if, if there's downtime, I'm usually trying to figure out how to market either partners that I already have and, and how to give those guys more bang for their buck or trying to locate and have conversations with new partners and to convince them that NASCAR is a good model to move their products, whether it be hospitality, taking people to the track or brand awareness and, and getting their name out there uh, to the millions of NASCAR fans across the country. The move that you made last year, there are a lot of people, especially during COVID, that either got downsized or decided it was time to change their job. Walk me through that that decision to change teams last year, Corey, because it seemed like you were really betting on there's got to be just a better solution than where you were at the time. Yeah, so I, I drove for a team called Go Fast for two years, and, and we had some success and good runs. And, you know, I felt like I was capable to run a little bit better. And there was an opportunity here with Spire Motorsports trying to ramp up their competitive side. They had a, a team the previous year, but they were looking to invest some money and actually go try to be, you know, competitive, a little more competitive uh, in terms of the grid. So they were taking a pretty healthy bet on the sport itself with NASCAR going to this next generation car next year. Uh, so to kind of even the playing field, quote unquote, it's never going to be even, but trying to get a little bit more even uh, with the future of the word NASCAR trying to push this car. I've always uh, had a pretty good relationship with TJ and Jeff Dickerson uh, who own Spire and, and decided to uh, jump in the boat with them and start rowing and, that I think there's something to the journey of trying to build something versus jump into something that already has been established and they hand you the keys and you start rolling. So it's been fun. It's been a challenge. We've had a little bit of hardship. So we all knew, we all expected, we also had some bad luck uh, as well to start the year. We started off ninth at the 500, but we haven't put a good run together since We've had a couple of bad lucks, a couple of mechanical failures, and uh, hopefully we can rebound here we're, this weekend here at Richmond. NASCAR's tried some different things. And uh, one of them that I watched a, f a few weeks ago was uh, dirt at Bristol and, and watching just watching the races just from the cameras that the networks were showing. Look like you couldn't see crap, man. I couldn't see anything out that front windshield. I had to tell, put me down there on the track. Uh, yeah, you couldn't see. We got caught up in a wreck because of that. Somebody spun out a couple cars up and a couple guys around us got, we had a missed and then we were collateral damage, but that was a little bit, a little bit gimmicky for me, to be honest, because I love Bristol and Bristol always puts on a good show with their normal, with their normal concrete track without bringing all the dirt in and doing something we don't, we don't know. And, and our cars aren't made for dirt. So, you know, somebody won, obviously Joey, Joey figured out how to get the job done and, and our day ended up early. So, but you know, obviously NASCAR saw a little bit of value. I think that it was the networks driving uh, that decision to buy SMI to put dirt on it. Cause I think Fox wanted to have something a little bit uh, out of the ordinary to yeah. spice up the broadcast a little bit, which I, they certainly got. But, you know, I think that all in all NASCAR is being a lot more flexible with their races and events than they have more so in the past. And it's pretty cool to be a part of it. Yeah. I find it an adventure every time I'm watching, <laughs> every time I'm watching a race now, you are a road warrior. You're gone a huge number of weeks and weekends what are some of the tricks to being effective living on the road for our fans that also are thinking about taking up jobs or they're just going into jobs or they're going on the road? Is there something about packing your suitcase or about hmm. catching the flight or any things that you've learned over time that, that are helpful? Always take an extra pair of drawers. You never <laughs> know when you catch rain, catch a flight delay. I think for me, it's important to spend quality time at the house with the wife when I am home because you just get in this habit of running, 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 being gone all the time, and you can forget about the people that matter the most. So really carve out uh, some time to hang out the wife and kid and be intentional about it certainly is important. Last question I have for you is what's the best advice you have for any young men or women thinking about getting into racing? Where should they begin? It's hard, man. It's uh you know, if you have a passion for it, that's what's going to be the driving force for it. And, you know, I, I would love to say don't quit at it because there's plenty of guys who have the capabilities, but they never got the breaks because the window is so small to try to get an opportunity in the Cup Series or to, to get an opportunity in anything to make a living at it. But if you love it enough, you'll stick around and figure out a way 
to capitalize on your resources and relationships uh, to try to make it, you know, and, and there's a lot more valleys and there are peaks in this deal. So regardless of, uh, of how low it might be, there's always a time for victory lane coming. So uh, stick with it. And, and I love helping kids and kind of giving them some advice because I've been as low as you can be and I've been as high as you can be at the same time. Corey, thanks a ton for spending some time with us. And hopefully as the season goes on, we watch those pennies stack up and become plenty of Benjamins. Good luck with the rest of the season, man. I appreciate that. I had fun. Big thanks to Corey LaJoy for stopping by. Well, um, no, no real fight there, OG. <laughs> I, uh, once he, once he immediately said, nope, not, uh, not, not infringing on your turf. I actually love what stacking pennies means because I think a lot of what we talk about on this show is really truly about that too, right? Focus on those fundamentals and right. the Benjamins happen. That's right. I was um, just talking to somebody. We had a business loan that we had for one of one of my businesses and it just got paid off. I didn't know that it was paid off. It's kind of on auto pay. And it just is so profound, the amount of money every year that was going to this payment and you just don't think about it. You go, well, $100 or $200, or I got a car and it's $500 or whatever. And you go, wait a second, man. That's like, I mean, a $500 payment, $6,000 a year. That's gone. But cooler than that, when it's done being paid, like that is a huge increase. I mean, if, if you make $60,000 a year and your car payment's $500 a month and it stops, like you pay it off, your take home went up probably 15%. Because of that 60, you know, your gross is 60. You don't actually see 60, right, after taxes and medical and all that sort of crap. But your take-home, your spendable cash went up 10, 15, 20% year over year, like just by not having that little teeny tiny thing that you went into going, yeah, it's not a big deal. It's just a, it's just a car payment. Right. We normalize it in our yeah. head. We, we, we completely normalize it. We're like, well, everybody else has debt like this, so I should have debt like that. I mean, yeah. who doesn't have this $500 payment? Right. It's really quite interesting when you just build it the right way, like how there's just piles of money that show up. Yeah, I think uh, Corey's got a long career in front of him. I was super excited to be able to talk to him. And by the way, thanks also to our friend and show listener, Kevin Kidd from Roush Racing, who's also appeared on the show talking about NASCAR. A couple of years ago, when we went and visited the pits of Roush Racing and uh, learned about teamwork from him. In fact, we'll link to that in our show guide as, as well. Hey, let's throw out Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Hot dogs and coleslaw. <laughs> Them's fighting words, I know. What a great day. And because it's a holiday, they're all fat free. Exactly. And hopefully Jesse from MetPro isn't listening. Jesse, it totally is fat free. Come on, just for a day. Let's do this. It's actually your loved ones in your time, but why not spend time with your loved ones with a hot dog in your hand? That's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. It's a simple application. They've simplified, gotten rid of all the baloney questions, affordable prices all online. And what a better thing to do on a holiday like today, remembering people have gone before us than to get your life insurance in order. Great gift for your family. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. A couple of weeks ago, we were part of a great podference, which also included How I Built This, our friends over at Brown Ambition, and many other top podcasts. We did a show about behind the scenes, making episodes and using technology and teamwork to create this podcast. During that, though, we took a bunch of calls that I think, OG, for people trying to get ahead through work were fantastic. And we couldn't get them all in then. So we're taking one today. This was uh, a call from Kate. Say hi, Kate. Hey there. When it comes to owning a business and having employees, I wanted to ask, how do you view company culture and creating something that is sustainable and uplifting? Oh, thanks for that question, Kate. Because OG and I both have been business owners for a long time, and I think we can speak to that. Plus, some of the guests that we've had on have spoken to company culture, but OG, company culture. I think that you have to figure out like what battles you want to fight and which ones you don't. 
Because there's so much stuff that you can, as a leader, put a lot of emphasis on. For example, you can mandate how people dress, right? You can say, hey, we have professional attire. You have to wear a certain tie. Uh, you have to wear a nice dress, you know, whatever. You can uh, mandate vacation time. We have these number of holidays that our company paid. You, we allow this number of this amount of time off. We have this many sick days that are allowed. You can uh, manage the uh, petty cash, right? You can say, these are the allowable expenses. These are the things that uh, count as a business expense for the firm. If you have employees that, that would, you know, charge things for the business. Or you can spend time on the stuff that really matters, which is like, what are the firm goals that we have? What are the company level outcomes that we're trying to achieve? And what are we trying to do for the people that we work for, like our customers or our clients? What are we trying to achieve for them? And I think that the more energy that you spend on the nickel and dime stuff, because you don't have any idea of what to do on the real stuff, impacts the culture quite a bit. And if all you're doing is talking about whether or not Sally's vacation time is approved, you know, versus going, I really think that that person, I think that employee is going to do the work that I hired them to do. And I think that they're an adult. And if they need a week off, they need a week off. Then that's that. And yeah, there's sometimes where people abuse that, just like they abuse the company credit card or they abuse the dress code or something like that. But then that's more of an exception. So I've always thought about it from the perspective of what do we really want to have our focus on? What do we want to have our focus and attention on as a group and make sure that everybody's kind of pointed that way? And the less energy and time we spend on the the minuscule things, I think the better everybody is kind of focusing on the goal of the organization. I agree with you. When it comes to company culture, I think there are some big companies that spend a lot of time telling the world that they have a great culture. When really, according to Ashley Goodall, a gentleman we spoke with uh, maybe a year and a half ago, and we will link to this in our show notes at Stacking Benjamins, he and his co-author Marcus Buckingham not only had a great piece in the Harvard Business Review, but the, it turned into a book I really like called Nine Lies About Work. And one of those lies, OG, is about company culture because culture to anybody working in a business is the people they interface with every day and the people they have lunch with. That's, that's the company culture. So at a place like Microsoft, where my son works, you have company culture that could be vastly different two tables in the cafeteria away from each other. Right. Just for horrible culture, fantastic culture. So instead of spending time and energy on convincing the rest of the world, you have a great culture. I think teaching first level managers, how to be good managers is extremely important to your culture. And there's two things I see get most people Kate in trouble when it comes to company culture. They mess with people's time off and they mess with their paycheck. And if you make promises about pay and you don't keep them, you, you lose people, you lose me. And if you mess with people's time off or for no reason in particular, deny time off. And I've had that happen. I'm sure OG, you've had that happen. And I've seen it happen to people around me. You're like, why the hell are they doing that? They're doing it because it's a power trip, apparently, and no other reason. Uh, just going, no, well, we, I remember that I had to work this one weekend just because my boss wanted to prove to me that he owned me on holiday weekends too. And I will tell you, he did own me that weekend and I was gone. Mentally, I put a lot less work into it, which also then you think about some of the benefits that you can offer your employees that may not cost very much, but are a huge impact to your employees. So if you can create a learning culture where you're helping people improve their resume. One of my favorite management gurus, Tom Peters says, if you help people leave you all the time by helping them with their resume and whatever they would do next, they will OG not only stay forever in a lot of cases because they know that you have their back, but second, if they do leave, you know what they do? They, they hook up the people they now interface with, with you. So if they go to work with somebody that in any way, can work with you, they end up being a bond between you and this new company that you didn't have before. 
And those bonds could be, could be absolutely huge. So I see, I see too many managers try to keep the glory on themselves and put their thumb on their people, make it so your people are constantly able to go and do better and do more things. And they will either stay forever or they will represent you forever and help you with deals in the future when they do leave. But I think that circles back, OG, to what you were talking about, you know, decide which battles are important. And for me, the important battle is, is that we have a team that loves working here and loves being together. Right. And everybody that works here will tell you this. And OG, you know this. None of us are very highly paid. What? (laughs) And it really, in in real life, that's why I'm fascinated by companies like Disney. Because Disney doesn't pay their their people. Well, like people like, oh, you're a big Disney fan. Uh, I don't, you know. The roller coasters, the, the, the theme parks, that stuff is fun. It's cool. But you know what I like about the theme park? I like watching the employees work. I just, I get so motivated watching how in most cases, Disney's able to bring this team together to believe in the shared vision without having to just throw money at them. I worked for a guy once that just thought the answer to everything was throw more money at people. And I felt like everybody on the team was completely checked out. And very highly paid. Any resources you like when it comes to company culture? I mentioned Tom Peters and Ashley Goodall, but I know you read about this stuff all the time. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, any leadership type of course or book is going to be helpful in some way, shape or form. I think that just like any sort of thing that you're trying to learn, you're going to hear a lot of the same stuff over and over again, just packaged differently. So, uh, probably, but but those are the truths, right? Well, I just, I was going to say that I think that it makes sense to consume as much as possible so that you figure out what those are. Like when you hear the same thing said 10 different ways, but it's the same thing, then like you said, you can say, okay, that's probably something I need to focus on. Thanks for that question, Kate. If you've got a question for us, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And we're happy to talk about anything around earning, saving, or spending in a better way. That's going to do it for today. Hey, uh, big thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this show. You know, showing people what the Stacking Benjamins Stacker family is all about is so important to us. So for people that have taken time to help us there, It's been great. And actually, OG, I've got all of these books. And because of some stuff that we're working on in the background, I haven't been able to give away books as often as I've been able to in the past. So here's what I'm going to do for the next few weeks. If you've been thinking about giving us a review and you haven't done it yet, leave us the review. Send me an email, joe at stackingbenjamins.com that says that you did. I'm going to start giving away uh, these stacks of books because no matter how quickly I give these away, I'm not going to be able to give them away fast enough. So we'll give away a book a week and hopefully in about uh, 20 weeks, we'll have given away a large part of this, of this stack of books. Okay. Here's one mom's putting on the refrigerator. Uh, This is five stars from S Miller, 2013. What's not to like five stars. Nothing gets me more excited than two guys. whose goal is to not teach a thing. All their talk about glide pass, efficient frontiers, target date funds, and after school activities always gets me in the mood to listen to another episode. But really, show's pretty great, I guess. <laughs> Keep up the work. Nice job, at S. Miller, 2013. And let's keep it our secret that we might be teaching a thing or two, but that's our secret. All right. All right. That's going to do it for today. Last but not least is if you're somebody, we talked a lot about financial planning today. If you're somebody who's ready to hire a financial advisory team and you want to know how OG's team stacks up against what you're doing already or other teams, schedule a first meeting, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG for their calendar. And that will get you headed down that path. All right. That's going to do it for today. Uh, Doug, you've got it from here, man. What should we have learned on this episode? Have a safe end of your holiday weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. So what should we have learned today? First, make sure to put your money to work rather than leaving it all in cash, which will help combat inflation. And be aware of prices so you don't buy something when it's most expensive. Second, take a lesson from Corey LaJoy. Even when things aren't going the way you want, if you can focus on getting the little things right, you shouldn't be surprised to see all of those little pennies turn into major improvements. But the big lesson? (laughs) Listen to the interview 
before assuming there's going to be a big SmackDown event. Turns out, stacking pennies, eh, it's a pretty good idea for all of us. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. To learn more about Corey LaJoy, tune into the Stacking Pennies podcast, where finer podcasts are found. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahide, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. I saw this movie a couple of weeks ago and we've talked about so many other things, way more important, like the lobster that got out of jail, right. That got off death row. Uh, this is a new movie that Cheryl and I went to see with Billy Crystal and Tiffany Haddish. Uh, have you seen the trailer for this movie? No, it's called uh, here today. Let's give it a listen. Thank you for bidding on me in the auction. I am so flattered that somebody your age would be a fan of my work. I don't know who the hell you are. My ex really wanted to meet you, so he bid. How much? $22. $2,200? That's fantastic. $22. It started at 20 and then it went up in 50 cent increments. I'm a comedy writer. All right, guys, very funny stuff. I also write for Broadway and movies. Why is your face suddenly bigger than it was before? Oh, my God, are you allergic to seafood? Oh, my God. She doesn't have insurance, and she really shouldn't be leaving him by herself. Your daughter is going to be fine. My, why did you tell the doctor that I was your father? I was a little loopy by then. Are you doing anything right now? No. Want some laughs? Come on, queen, smile, girl, smile. Marilyn Monroe from the Seven Year Itch. Mm. I'd be itching too if I had hot subway air blowing up my ass. Doctor, thanks for seeing me so late. How's the writing going? It's all of these young kids. In the tradition of George Carlin and Richard Pryor. Somebody's got to talk to Roger about his inflections. Come on, sub peanut. What, what is that, a very small peanut? Are you doing what we talked about? I try not to vary my routine. You have medicines to help you. I was backed up for like eight days. And you can always give yourself an enema. I'm saving that for my birthday. All right, it gets a little gross sometimes, like in that last joke. But uh, Billy Crystal wrote this film which stars, as you heard, he and Tiffany Haddish uh, here today. And as you also heard at the beginning, he's a comedy writer, OG, uh, for a Saturday Night Live-like TV show. Uh, he's a guy nearing retirement with a bunch of other young writers. So he's the, on one hand, he's the voice of reason in the room. On the other hand, you there are a couple scenes where the young writers are like, what is he still doing here? Why don't we get rid of this guy? And it's funny because the amount that he's been helping the writers around him, which uh, goes on throughout the show, ends up being one of the subplots of the entire show. I like, obviously, watching these Saturday Night Live type shows being made. Uh, so I like kind of that, that back room feel. But also, I felt like the chemistry between him and Tiffany Haddish, whose boyfriend, you heard, won him in an auction, won a lunch with him in an auction. And because she was trying to stick it to him because she now hates him, she decided to go to lunch, no idea who he is, and they end up hitting it off. But there's something else going on, which is that Billy Crystal, as you heard at the end, 
is having some problems with early onset dementia. So the second, the second movie, by the way, this year, we talked about the father with uh, Anthony Hopkins a few weeks ago and that he won best actor uh, Mm -hmm. in, in the Academy Awards was fantastic. Two movies about dementia. And I like both of them, but, but do you think, why are people making movies about dementia? Do you think there might be a year back in here recently that we want to forget? Like maybe, maybe, maybe we're like, you know, if I could just get some dementia right now, uh, things might be, be better. And of course it's not a laughing matter. And, uh, Billy Crystal really struggling with it. You know, the critics were, the critics are, uh, split on this movie. I think it got just below the fresh tomato score. I think it got like a 57%. Doesn't surprise me because it's a comedy. Usually when I go see comedies and OG, a lot of the time when you review movies, they, they don't get the fresh tomato score. Cause you like a lot of action movies. This film, I thought, I thought, I don't know, it hit where I am right now. I wanted something lighter, but with some meaning to it. And Cheryl said to me as we left the theater, how long has it been since we've seen a character driven comedy show that's kind of endearing? I will say the last 20 minutes gets kind of really sappy, gets, gets really sappy. I, I like the last 20 minutes, but man, they were beating me over the head with the meeting a little bit at the end and, and the Billy Crystal's big aha could have probably been maybe half the length of time that it took to get there. But, but I really liked it. I think it's a feel good movie that a lot of people are going to like critics are going to be divided because I think because of some of the sappiness in the movie. Um, but I thought uh, Billy Crystal, and Tiffany Haddish uh, did a great job here. Big thumb up. I think you'd laugh your way through it. OG. Oh, okie dokie. I'll check it out here today. <laughs> 